All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, for those of you that are in the room, hopefully you really love lifestyle applications. How many of you are building lifestyle apps? And everyone in here? All right, awesome. How many of you are game developers? Just, all right, just checking. If you're a game developer, you may want to go to the game section. Uh, it's over in Nux, uh, but otherwise, you can hang out. Uh, my understanding, based on a conversation I just had with Giselle, who, by the way, is doing a phenomenal job at this event, um, she has told us that we are going to make all these videos available to folks up on our dev site and certainly for the attendees. Uh, and so if you did miss the game session, you'll have an opportunity to actually get that. So what I'm going to do now is introduce our panel, and I'm likely to, uh, forgiveness and indulgences, please mess all these up because I'm terrible with names. That's why I work at Facebook. Um, and so uh, what we uh, have is three folks that work on products. They're product leaders at a variety of different mobile startups that have been successful building out and utilizing Facebook as a growth engine uh, for them to acquire new users as well as get re-engagement. And so the intent of this panel is for, one, for these folks to share with you some of the best practices that they've had, both building mobile apps as well as their work uh, building on top of the Facebook platform. And I'm going to be asking some questions, but then we're going to open it up to all of you folks so you can ask questions about the experiences these folks have had about building out their products. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start on this side. Uh, this is Brian. Brian is actually the director of product at Goodreads. I love that product. Uh, this product, for those of you that don't actually utilize it, uh, is one where you can actually say which books you've read, share that with your friends, have a conversation. And so Brian's been doing this, uh, building products for the last 10 years. And Goodreads is actually, as I said, uh, a really nice Facebook application. It has both mobile as well as web. And I think right now you guys are about uh, 12 million um, monthly active users, so pretty successful. Uh, in the middle here, we have Noah. Noah is a product manager at Foursquare. Many of you know about Foursquare. In fact, I'm sure, in fact, I did see many people actually checking in uh, utilizing Foursquare. Uh, and they actually utilize Facebook, um, and they're, you know, based, uh, you guys are based in New York, is that right? Um, based in New York, so he flew all the way in from New York and braved, I guess, the wilds of Sur uh, Hurricane Sandy uh, is just sort of ending there. Uh, and so uh, we welcome Noah to be here. Uh, then we have Colin. Colin actually works at Stitcher. Uh, Stitcher is a really interesting thing if you haven't seen it. Uh, Stitcher actually lets you listen to uh, radio and podcasts, et cetera, and you can share that with your friends. Uh, there are a lot of folks at uh, Facebook that actually utilize Stitcher, and this is how you find out really interesting things like things your mother didn't teach you uh, or you know, science you didn't know. Um, so um, this will be interesting to get his perspective. And I'm going to mess this up, but I'm going to try. Fej, did I do it? OK, Fej. Fej actually works at Waze, and I run by Waze every single day because they're in downtown Palo Alto. If I didn't run by them, I would weigh 500 pounds. Uh, Waze uh, is a great mobile and web application that allows you to do lots of different location services. Uh, their main development is done out of Israel, but they have a huge, um, well, I won't say huge, but they have a, a good presence here in Silicon Valley. And so the four of these folks have a lot of experience building on top of mobile and building on top of Facebook. And so I'm looking forward to this conversation. So I think I'll just start by, we'll go in order here, and I'll just ask you guys to sort of talk a little bit about your app, what success you've seen, as well as you know, how you've utilized Facebook to hopefully help your app. Or in some, if it didn't help, I'd love to know that too. <laughs> go ahead. Sure. So you mentioned the, the 12 million member number. And just for some perspective, at the end of 2011, we were at 6.5 million members, and we are already growing quickly uh, at that rate, but the last 12 months we've gotten really close with Facebook and we've worked really closely with the open graph, and that's really accelerated the growth that we were seeing. So um, I think Goodreads is a real case study as to how working closely with Facebook and the open graph and some of the requests can really uh, speed up the growth that you might already be seeing with your apps, and that's across our entire app as well as mobile too. Um, it, it, a large part of it is because the products really fit together well. If you think about what Goodreads is about, it's about helping people discover and share the books they love. And you know, books themselves are inherently social. Goodreads is social. Um, books, um, w when you think about a book and when people first started publishing stories, um, the first thing people would do is talk about the books they like, recommend them to their friends. Um, when you go over to a friend's house, um, one of the first things you'll do is you'll look at their bookshelves to see you know, what they're reading because it really expresses you know, who they are and tells you uh, who they are. So you can see how that fits really naturally with you know, what Facebook offers. Um, so 
you know, that discovery um, and sharing process, which happens on Goodreads, when people say, this is a book I just read and I loved it, publishing that to the Open Graph is something people respond really well to. And, you know, that referral process, you know, seeing that and, you know, drives people back to Goodreads. It's helped our growth and it's helped our mobile growth. So we're happy to talk more about kind of how that works, but it's, it's been great for us. Cool. Noah? Yeah, so at Foursquare, we use Facebook for pretty much every part of kind of the sign-up and onboarding flow for new users. Uh, I guess it starts kind of further up the funnel with Open Graph. Uh, you know, like Goodreads, I think sharing the places that you go and the experiences you have there fits really well with how people are using Facebook already. Uh, so Open Graph kind of just codified that a little bit. Uh, we get, I was just pulling the stats earlier, we get about uh, roughly 10% of our signups actually come from Facebook referral traffic, uh, which is obviously one of our biggest sources. Uh, when people actually do sign up, we get about 45% of people actually use the sign up with Facebook uh, button to actually begin the sign up flow. Uh, one of the slides earlier today was about, uh, I guess maybe it was in the context of games, but how people who actually are connected with Facebook wind up being better users. I was pulling again some stats on that, and we see actually People who sign up with Facebook add sixty percent more friends in the first week. Huh. Uh, they wind up the chance that they are active three months later winds up being about twenty percent higher as well. Uh, so in general, they produce better users. Uh, you know, there might be a little bit of sample bias that people who are coming from Facebook are already social, so the service fits well with them. But we, we see a lot of success there. Uh, and then the last thing we kind of use it for a little bit of well is onboarding. So obviously, kind of bootstrapping your social graph on Foursquare from the friends that you have on Facebook. Uh, and some things that we're starting to look into now are how can we use a little bit more about your actual profile uh, to actually kind of bootstrap our recommendation experience. Uh, so that's kind of one of the big directions we're investing in now is kind of giving you recommendations about where you've been or uh, places to go based on where you've been and where your friends have been. And then how can we take kind of the data that we have from Facebook, from your timeline to help kind of bootstrap that to give you more personalized recommendations as soon as you sign up for the service. So that's kind of the big kind of area that we're working on now. So at, excuse me, at Stitcher, um, people connect with their favorite interests, their shows, um, and it's really about discovery. That's what our, our users are really um, coming to Stitcher for. Uh, and the Facebook experience really enables that from the beginning to the end. Aside from just users um, hearing about Stitcher um, from their friends listening, which is a, a key part of the, of the value proposition for a developer, uh, for the user, which is where it's most important, the social context really helps people discover shows on Stitcher, discover episodes. And so we can instantly personalize that experience from the beginning by connecting to um, some of their graph data, so whether their likes or their interests or their locations. Um, but we're also using what their friends are listening to help them discover other shows that are that are relevant to them. And so, um, you know, I think it's really important, you know, for our success to have focused a lot on the existing user experience and not so much the funnel. Um, and, and by really creating an integrated social experience there, you know, we've been more than happy with the amount of open graph traffic we get from that. Um, and it's really just sort of making sure that it fits inside of our context and not sort of doing social for social sake. Okay, so uh, in case some of you are less familiar with Waze, uh, what we call ourselves is social GPS. And I think uh, one of the main items, uh, or I'd say that's why we have it as a first item, is the social aspect. We provide a free GPS navigation application, which is totally user-generated from the map itself, whereas the users can actually pave the map, modify the map, enhance the map, and... Above that, we have layers of information which are vital while you're driving, like uh, accidents, hazards on the road, traffic jams, etc. And the whole idea is that we are actually building the system on viral distribution. So the more users we have, the better the data is, the better the value is for the drivers. The idea is one for all and all for one. So you are reporting on something that's happening to you. Maybe you're stuck in a traffic jam, but hopefully next time that you're driving, someone else will be reporting, and then you can circumvent that and drive around it. Uh, our connection to Facebook is done in steps, so initially we just reported events, uh, got feedback, and modified it. Then we connected to the open graph. Recent release, we went with the single sign-on. So we're trying to be very social. On the other hand, the audience is drivers, so we have to be uh, somewhat uh, careful about what we do. Uh, we do have interaction at the beginning and the end of the uh, drive, and obviously important events that are happening along the way. 
but it's a tough, uh, tough scenario of drivers and social, and we try to balance it out and actually experiment a lot with it over the releases. Great. Um, so the real uh, question uh, many of you have been asking is, is you guys uh, are in the top of the charts. If you look at iOS, you look at web traffic, et cetera. Was there a key sort of, uh, not just Facebook, but was there a key product feature you added or initiative or something you did in terms of the product strategy that really enabled you guys to grow pretty quickly? I'll just throw that out to anyone. And what is the key to growth other than um, utilizing Facebook? Is it, you know, one of the things that we've done, and we've seen this being replicated in a number of other uh, places as well, is we actually have a dedicated growth team. And I don't know how many of you folks actually do that. Uh, where it, the rule of the day is A-B split testing just about everything, even the colors of buttons and how many pixels you have. And uh, I don't know, it'd be interesting to hear what your folks' growth strategy were, especially for iOS or Android. Like, how do you get to the top of the store? How do you, you know, take advantage of whatever distribution may be out there so users get to discover your apps? I, I guess my answer to that would be there is no single kind of, like, kink that happened in the graph. I think when you look at any even like kind of exponential graph for most startups, what you see is actually a series of kind of step functions mm -hmm. that get kind of bigger steps over time. Uh, normally we see the steps correspond with like product features that we release. Uh, it's new functionality, it's releasing, you know, two years ago my first project was to do explore, to give recommendations, so adding a totally new kind of value that you have for the service. Uh, I think it's hard when you look at kind of graphs, you see this like steep curve and because of the way that like compounding works, that curve gets steeper and steeper. And you think, oh, there must have been this like inflection point when that took off. Uh, but I think that's usually not the case. Uh, and I've talked to, fr I run the growth team at Foursquare. I've talked to friends at Facebook and Twitter. And I think everyone really says that. Uh, sometimes those steps are kind of exogenous, right? Sometimes there are, uh, maybe a big brand picks you up or maybe there's like a media coverage event that happens. Uh, but, but yeah, I think it's to your point about growth is like it's constant iteration on all the parts of the funnel, whether it's the kind of people coming in uh, and maybe that's distribution through Facebook, maybe it's kind of SEO optimization, uh, or people actually going through that sign-up funnel. How do they get into it? How do you make sure that they're complete? And then also, how do you make sure they're set up for success? Uh, you know, just having someone register an account but not necessarily having any friends or having any interest filled out, uh, the chance that they're going to have a good experience on your service may be pretty small, uh, and those users may not really matter that much. Uh, so I think, yeah, it's kind of constant iteration and kind of realizing that there isn't one kink that you're going to see one day probably, uh, it's most likely just a bunch of step functions that when you zoom out look exponential but really don't feel that way when you're building it. Anyone else care to comment? I would say, you know, in our experience, it's really been about just trying to create the best product. So really listening to our users, I think echoing, you know, what Noah said about iterating and, and being very close um, with the data. Um, the other sort of thing that I've noticed and I remarked that is that I talked to my colleagues and sort of you can categorize it in a couple of different ways, but uh, you know, about 40 to 60% of new users that come to your app discover it because someone in their social network knew about it or used the app. So that, whether that's word of mouth by, hey, check out what app I just got. Um, you can sort of bucket Facebook in there. It's a little bit more structural and you can be tactical with it. Um, it's really about creating experiences that users find really valuable and they love. I mean, we all know that the App Store experiences are, are less than desirable in many ways, and it's really hard for a new and upcoming app to, to really make a lot of progress up there against people that have sort of dug in at the top, and, and really the way to do that, that that I've seen people be successful at is just focusing on getting things that people will talk about and that they'll use. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the one thing I would say is, um, I mean, with Goodreads, it's a little bit different. Um, you know, we already had this very active community by the time we launched our mobile app. Um, but when it came to building that community, a lot of it was about listening to members and, and making enhancements to the product around what they, what they wanted and really uh, you know, get, engaging with people and building their feedback into the product. And over time, I mean, word of mouth is always going to be your, your biggest growth driver if you can get that. And that applies um, when you launch an app, too, is just understanding you know, what people are, are upset about, you know, why they're giving you certain ratings, being willing to jump in and engage with them. Uh, and, and build that feedback into your product. I mean, the advantage we had was by the time we, we got serious about investing in iOS and Android app, we already had a very engaged community on the web. And, you know, um, you know they wanted to take our product mobily. They wanted to discover books um, while they were on the go. And uh, the one thing I will say is uh, Facebook has really amplified the growth that we had already. And that, that gets to the points that you were making earlier about you know, how if you have things that you can share into the open graph and one of you know, your friends consumes it on a, a mobile device through Facebook and they click, you know, building a very clean referral path 
uh, directly into that iOS, uh, iOS or Android app, and that's really helped us grow our mobile numbers. I agree that there's no specific uh, feature. I think that uh, w our way was actually empowering the users, the power users, as much as possible. So, uh, for example, our country leaders, uh, where there's an active community, they actually assign the area managers and give them certain rights. Certain uh, country managers and area managers can actually uh, participate and, and manage the forums. Uh, I think that a lot of the jumps that, that I see, at least in ways, came from uh, external events like, let's say, Carmageddon, where we uh, really uh, focused on the Metro of LA while they had that event and actually uh, convinced and, and show users that we can actually help them circumvent that big issue. And uh, I think that given that uh, this worked and we were able to actually take it into one big metro, we could then take it to additional metros. Right. So one of the interesting things um, I, I think a lot of uh, folks uh, wonder about, and I myself get this question quite a bit, is what the investment is from an engineering perspective or from a product perspective between web, desktop web in particular, uh, as be uh, between that and native applications. You guys care to share, you know, uh, where you're seeing a lot of growth, what your strategy is between web and native applications, sort of how you think about that space from a product standpoint? Anyone? We're not exactly, I would say, native. First of all, we're primarily mobile. Um, the way we actually did that, it was uh, start with the iOS, uh, take what we thought was the best user experience, and uh, left some of the items uh, to be our own kind of like uh, design. When we went to Android, we took some of the items that were necessary, like let's say the back button, but overall tried to keep the same experience uh, across both platforms. And the idea was that in that case, we don't go native all the way and then uh, able to retain what we think is mandatory for drivers, what we think is gives the best value. So it's like a combination. We didn't actually go too much web. We do have a website, but it's far less used than the mobile application. You know, our our landscape has changed. Um, even last week, we, we launched a desktop application in HTML5. Um, but when we started out, we, we focused on the core use case, which was mobile. Um, people were listening on the go, whether they were in their cars, on the, the train, um, running. Uh, that was that was where we, where we started. So we were more mobile first, and you know, really, I think once your service has sort of gotten to a level where users have a need for it in a number of places, then platform expansion makes makes sense. Um, you know, if we had tried to to bite off every single platform, um, we had a little bit of a, a run around with BlackBerry for a while. Um, you know, you're you're going to stretch your your resources pretty thin. Um, we're now heavily weighted on, on mobile platform, but, but the team on, on web is growing, um, particularly as there are new ways to do things in web on mobile. Um, so we have several engineers that, that are particularly um, you know, well experienced with Facebook that are doing more and more things inside the mobile app, but are in web technologies because um, as I'm sure has been echoed quite a bit, it's an iterative process of testing and, and there's no sort of single recipe for everyone. And so the faster we can change things on the mobile device, the more we can learn, and the more all of those key numbers can, can change in positive directions. Um, you guys uh, have anything to share? Yeah, um, just that you know we're, we're much more web heavy, um, but that's changing rapidly for us. We've seen uh, our, mo our mobile numbers really start to jump up. I think since May, 20% of our new signups have been mobile, and we're starting to change our investment. Likewise, I think the way we've been looking at it is you know, trying to take the key features that our, our users really love on the website that they want to take with them on the go and build those into their iOS and Android apps. At the same time, try to identify things that they can do differently, such as um, you know scanning, barcode scanning their books. That's something you can't do with your computer, but it's something that people love about our mobile app. Um, but yeah, I think you know the future is pretty clear that more and more people want to do this on their mobile devices, and we're looking to build the mobile team around that. Okay, Noah? Yeah, just to add on to what everyone said, I guess for us, obviously, it's been very much a mobile first kind of application, just like Stitcher and Waze. Um, you know, it is about being out in the real world and sharing those experiences and finding new experiences. 
the way that we kind of look at web is really mostly actually as kind of a user acquisition source, uh, both in terms of referral traffic from Facebook and Twitter, uh, SEO from Google. What we see is approximately about a third of our signups come via web, uh, but only about 10% of our daily actives actually are using the website in any given day. Uh, so we definitely see it as an entry point, but not necessarily as a dedicated experience. Uh, so most of the investment that we do on web is really about how do we have that initial kind of a landing experience, whether you're coming from a friend sharing experience on Facebook, you're coming from searching for, you know, a place in Palo Alto and you land on Foursquare. How do we get people into the sign-up funnel? Uh, we had an experiment for a year of trying to build out basically kind of feature parity on web uh, for all of our kind of logged in users, which was... I would say a moderate waste of time, not a colossal waste of time. Uh, it turns out that most people who are using mobile don't really have a desperate desire to like use the website version of exactly the same functionality. Um, so, I mean, everyone will get their own mileage depending on the service. Obviously, maybe Goodreads is something where you're obviously planning ahead a little bit more. It's more of a kind of a browsing experience. Uh, but if you are something that works well on mobile, building the exact same thing on web may not actually be worth your time unless you're thinking about how it makes sense for people who are arriving on your website. I would say one comment, and I think also refers to, to Foursquare. I mean, uh, I'm editing some venues, but that's, I think, much more logical to do on the web. The same thing in, in ways where the actual mapping activities of the super users is being done on the web. So. I think that on a daily basis, the drivers are obviously using the mobile. There's no other alternative. But some of the features that you can easily do on the web that have actual sense uh, definitely uh, do uh, require web capabilities in that respect. Speaking of the web, one of the perma questions I often get, particularly based on our own investment and our own sort of story here, uh, has always been this proverbial, um, I, how should I say, the competition uh, between native and web, uh, particularly on mobile. Uh, many of you know that we adopted a strategy where we basically built Facebook, at least our mobile apps, utilizing HTML5 for a lot of the different views. Uh, and then you know, we quickly realized that we weren't quite going to get the performance that we wanted, particularly on iOS, uh, because of jitting issues uh, in those web views. I, I'd be interested to hear your folks' perspective on what your journey has been in terms of you know, the hope for the web on mobile. Is it the once and future platform? Um, is it going to come back? I mean, what, how do you guys think about the, the space? I think web views have a time and a place, but there are not that many times for them right now with the way that current mobile platforms look like. Uh, from like a practicality standpoint, I wish that we could develop everything in HTML5 and just put in a big web view and call it a day. And like when iOS first launched, that was what Apple said to developers, right? It was like, hey, we don't even have native apps except for our own. Go build web apps and get them pinned to people's home screen. And like, that'll be a great experience. Uh, it turned out obviously not to be the case. Uh, I think for us, we, we use web views basically in places where people will interact with infrequently but are fairly complex or changing often, uh, and that when you interact with them, they're fairly simple interactions. So a good example of that is like user settings. Uh, making that native to get like a little bit better scrolling doesn't really matter that much, uh, but being able to push changes quickly, being able to save the time of doing it cross-platform is worth it. Uh, any area of the app that people are really interacting with and like the responsiveness matters, uh, We've tried to experiment a lot with doing different web approaches and like Facebook's experience. Uh, I guess we never went fully into the web direction, but it, it never really worked out. Uh, I think we have hope for the future, but in the current kind of state of the world, it's probably not worth doing. Um, but given that there are really only two mobile platforms that matter, you're roughly doubling the work as if you did it all web. Uh, so the cost is not prohibitively high. Um, but that's kind of where we stand now. I want to I want to push another question on the stack, and maybe I have you address it because it just made me think of something. I, how do you folks feel about the fact that there's basically the web, which is predominantly for desktop, then there's iOS and there's Android, and that's kind of it. Uh, I mean, how do you think about that as a application developer? You're basically beholden to two things. Uh, I am happy there are iOS and Android. I'm less happy that there are other platforms that are still kind of living around. And so I, you'd rather kill any third platform alternative? Uh, I mean, we, so I should say, I love Pete. He's our BlackBerry developer. He's a great guy. Uh, and he loves BlackBerry for some reason. Uh, but we like as having to support a third platform. He likes uh, the keyboard. Yeah, the keyboard is fantastic for him. Um, no, but I, I think it's healthy to have two platforms that are driving each other forward. I think having any more to really support is really a pain. Uh, I mean, you're seeing Microsoft, right, with Windows Phone 7. Uh, they are not too quietly building a lot of apps for some, what they view as like destination experiences mm -hmm. themselves because it's not worth it for the app developers to do it. Um, 
I think the one thing that saved us a lot of time with mobile development, and I guess, again, your mileage may vary, is that all of our own apps are built on our public APIs, uh, which yeah. helps us both kind of make sure that we don't have too much of our actual like model leaking out into the actual apps themselves. So almost all of the logic is really on the server side, and the apps really are kind of rendering clients. Uh, so in terms of like chirp speed of development, we really try to offload as much of the logic uh, onto the server itself, which makes it less bad. Uh, but again, like two is the perfect number. It's a healthy competition, and any more, I think, is actually just really distracting. Other thoughts on both HTML5 as well as uh, the state of mobile platforms? Well, we, we made some experiment with HTML5, and uh, we didn't uh, continue it because uh, at the end we, we decided to focus on two uh, platforms, just like Foursquare. Uh, originally, we came from Windows Mobile, then we had uh, Nokia, Symbian, and then we even had BlackBerry. But at the end of the day, they simply could not carry the application the way we wanted it to, to behave, the even just even resources-wise, memory and CPU. Uh, we do work in similar manner, whereas a lot of the logic is on the server side. Uh, and in that respect, uh, HTML5 could have worked, but it simply, I think, mainly because of the Android and different uh, uh, screen size and, and resolutions did, didn't come out as we expect, and we decided just to focus on those two, two platforms. I, I think a third one would be definitely interesting. It, it, it might take more on the development, and that's why we uh, historically had a source code base that was uh, common to all these uh, platforms. I assume it's still somewhere hidden, I mean, unless they deleted it, but Theoretically, if there is a third platform, uh, we could uh, migrate uh, and port it. And hopefully, if, if we don't go too much native, we're actually able to do it and keep the same experience. So that's why we had a lot of balance between the native development and actual, our own, let's say, uh, UI and visual look and feel. Colin O'Brien. I think, I guess the only thing else I have to add is to, to not forget how difficult it is to get a user to go through the download process. Mm, yeah. uh, and, and that's really where we're pushing a lot of our HTML5 right now. Um, you know, in the app, it's a limited use case, um, like Noah said. But if you're using Facebook and you know, if deep linking isn't working perfect for you for your use case, um, or you have other sharing methods, those users um, think about them landing on a you know a 60% or a 40% functional web app to get that first part of that experience before asking them to go through the download process. You will see upticks in in your conversion rate. Um, there's, it's just a lot of um, a, a lot of effort. It's a it's a very big drop off in the funnel when you deliver them to the app store page for a number of reasons. Um, aside from the fact that it's really hard to actually make that thing look pretty, um, it's a good place for for web there. Brian, anything to add? Okay. So um, the other thing um, I'm interested to learn is, were there any specific products that you did, or how do you think about, when you think about mobile, do you think about the tablet differently than you do the phone? Is there s different product experiences that you've sort of come up with that the capabilities that you have? Uh, I know a lot of people sort of struggle with, not only are there all these mobile platforms, but you may have many different form factors, particularly on Android, where there may be thousands of permutations. Uh, but I don't know whether or not you guys have certain designs or products that you think about the tablet and different than you do to the phone. Yes, no, maybe? I would say absolutely. I mean, the, the tablet is an entirely different form factor. So if you want your app to look beautiful and perform well on a tablet, you have to think about it specifically as a tablet use case. Um, I think in Stitcher's case, our core listener experience is the same. Um, on the tablet, we enable more discovery. So. You know, the, the use case is slightly different than someone with headphones in, in their pocket. They're more likely to maybe sitting on their couch or in a place where they have more time to browse around. So we put more investment into those types of features. Um, but, you know, from a design perspective, you've got to think about it differently. And do you, uh, I'll throw this out as well, do you think the tab a web experience on the tablet is good enough or do you think you need a native experience on the tablet? Um, I mean, Zuck was famous, you know, famously it said, you know, the tablet wasn't, wasn't mobile at one stage. Um, and so I don't repeat that if you're in the press. Uh, <laughs> it is mobile. Um, but do you think, of, is the web good enough for a tablet or should you build a native experience there as well? We've built a native experience for the same performance reasons. So okay. other thoughts on tablets or? Yeah, I, I mean, I think, I think it's important to think about tablets separately. Uh, we haven't gotten 
there yet. I think you know we've made some tweaks to our tablet experience, but it's very similar to the phone experience, and that's one of the places we want to invest. Uh, what I will say is that I think even a, um, a tablet experience that's native that hasn't been totally optimized is better than just trying to port over your website. So I think, at least for Goodreads, I think you know it, it makes sense to, to customize it for that portable form factor, just because people want to grab a tablet and sit down on their couch and just peruse books that their friends are reading. You just have to capture that. You know, that's different than like what you would do on a website on your PC or your Mac. Yeah, this has been an area of hot contention internally for a long time. Every hack day, there's always a team of people who go, we actually don't have, I should say, a tablet app on iOS that's been deliberate. Uh, but every hack day, someone goes and like builds a really crappy version of Foursquare on the tablet. And everyone's like, oh, maybe that's interesting. We always decide not to. Uh, I think I actually agree with Zuck if you caveat it that I don't think tablets are used in a mobile context. They are like obviously a mobile device, but when we do user research and talk to people how they use their tablets, where they use their, their tablets, it's very much in like a lean back experience, yeah. usually in their home. Uh, I mean, sometimes on an airplane, obviously, you see everyone has their iPod out, uh, and maybe sometimes in a work context, but it's not in like you're walking around the real world, ex unless you're like a tourist in Central Park taking pictures on your iP iPad. Uh, which is really awkward. Uh, so in general, we don't see it as something that you use when you're out and about, uh, making it kind of less interesting for our use case. Uh, the thing that we thought about doing is building a kind of like tablet experience that is focused only on discovery. I guess mm -hmm. you're saying Stitcher is like more focused there. I think for us it would be you know simply like, hey, you open up the tablet app and it's just recommendations for places and you're using it to kind of plan your night out or plan your weekend uh, and really like cut out pretty much the rest of the experience and see how that feels. Uh, we haven't built it just from a prioritization standpoint, but we definitely would view it as a, not just as a different form factor, but as a very different kind of use case and context that you're building for. So yeah, likewise, we didn't see the tablet as something that's fitting for uh, commuters. Um, and uh, the only, by the way, the only usage in, in that respect is usually the kids that are playing in the back and having fun with ways uh, on, on iPads and uh, other tablets. Uh, the one variation we did do was for TV broadcast, whereas uh, we have uh, a certain program that they, in, uh, in certain uh, metros, uh, well, actually almost 20 metros, they can use our uh, application on the iPad uh, for broadcast services, and that is something where we did do a variation, uh, and they are actually uh, seeing more uh, relevant information because this is something that they are actually using for podcasts, but it's not really a mobile uh, driving experience in that respect. Great. And so one of the questions we get asked a lot is, particularly in the United States, um, we have a you know, large penetration of folks that are in the United States as well as in Canada are Facebook users. Uh, and so most of our growth is actually coming from outside of the United States and outside of North America. I'd be interested to know what your folks' um, growth strategies and user strategies are outside of the United States. Uh, and particularly, how do you think about emerging markets where they may not have access to all the different smartphones and the different capabilities that we sort of all take for granted here in Silicon Valley? I don't know if any of you have thoughts uh, about that. Well, um, we launched Waze uh, globally, so in some places it caught on, in some places definitely the issue of, of uh, mobile penetration I is an issue. But uh, you'd be surprised. I mean, places like Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, Latin America, they have a lot of uh, mobile. Um, I think some of the in some of the cases the issue might be the data plan. They have the mobile, but maybe yep. data connectivity. But overall... Uh, definitely we see an immense growth and we don't see uh, in that respect any any limitation from our point of view of just you know opening the service letting the users start and where we see growth like you know Italy France Brazil Malaysia etc we put more effort so we actually can like uh, see where it catches on and then we can actually put some more focus on it and let me, I'll double click into that and I'd love to get answers from you folks. I mean, ha, do you think about different interfaces like SMS? Like, you know, one of the things we've offered with Facebook is an SMS interface potentially. Um, and I don't know whether or not you think about uh, alternative interfaces, for the, particularly for data plans. That's one of the core reasons we do it. But I'm just interested in your sort of international strategies all up. So uh, in, in our case, there's not, not much alternative to the uh, in mobile internet. Uh, we are thinking maybe of uh, supporting offline kind of navigation, but the whole idea is really making it live and getting the information in real time, and it's a different application if it's not real time. Yeah. Other thoughts? 
Uh, as a streaming media company, uh, we don't like um, tiered data plans. <laughs> um, <laughs> we hope that there are more unlimited plans, although that for a while seems to, to not be existing. Um, you know, we're about creating content ecosystems. So we're really focusing on North America and, and really starting to serve uh, those audiences which have popped up in very much the same way. Um, expat communities, interestingly enough, um, in, in the US who are listening to foreign language um, on Stitcher, uh, a growing Latin American audience, um, really sort of letting those communities sort of grow as is and, and will develop products for them as they, they sort of get to critical mass. Um, from a technology perspective, you know, I think that there will be some interesting, um, you know, whether it's maybe web, like not web OS, but sort of, you know, you got Boot to Gecko coming, which is potentially going to be pretty big in, in Latin America, sort of the more browser-based operating systems. That, I think, is, is something that we'll be keeping our eye on um, in the future. Yeah, we've followed a pretty similar path where the service was international from day one. Uh, but not translated. Uh, and what we basically did was see where there was kind of uptake in different countries and then kind of follow that path and translate the service there. Uh, we always would see kind of a pretty big inflection when that would, that, I guess that is the one inflection point is when you translate the service, all of a sudden a bunch of people who couldn't read what was going on now can read it and it's now parsable. Uh, for us, I guess the major kind of countries of growth outside kind of the US and Canada uh, is like brick minus China conspicuously. Uh, but those are definitely kind of the biggest. We also see a lot in kind of Southeast Asia, uh, Japan. I mean, it pretty much mirrors where you're seeing kind of mobile penetration. Uh, the one interesting thing in terms of, I guess, the device layout is in the U.S., you know, we're still dominantly iPhone. Uh, international, Android has far surpassed iPhone, both in terms of active users and our top-line growth. Uh, and BlackBerry usage in particular is... I guess this is the one reason why uh, Pete is still working on the BlackBerry, really, is that in the U.S., it's about 2 or 3% of our uh, signups and active users. Internationally, when you subtract out the U.S., it's about 17%. Uh, that's heavily skewed towards uh, Southeast Asia and Latin America, where there's, like, you know, the Blackberries that you threw away when you upgraded to your iPhone a couple of years ago, they're recycling now in Indonesia and uh, the Philippines, and they're using their QWERTY keyboards and, like, BB7 to use really mediocre smartphone apps. Uh, but there's a lot of those people, yes. and that's how it's successful. But we we haven't really done too much on the like SMS interface or uh, you know subsidized data plans or anything. I think that's like the next level of scale when you have to confront those problems. Okay. Right. Sure. Yeah. So uh, we we have a lot of international visitors to Goodreads. Um, you know, people love to read everywhere. We haven't uh, translated our site. It's a huge growth opportunity for us in the future. It's something we're we're monitoring really closely. Um, obviously, places where you know, English is the native language, we get a lot of traction, and even places where it's not, people are coming in. Um, you know, not sure that it would necessarily be a mobile first strategy for us as far as growth. I think we just think about how we would translate our site and expand our metadata to capture international books, but I think it's something we're, we're definitely thinking about hard. Okay. So uh, I know a question on many folks' minds. Uh, games have a clear monetization mechanism. I mean, many of the folks know that you can buy many purple unicorns. Uh, the marginal cost of goods uh, sold cogs for another purple unicorn is pretty much zero. Um, and so for those of you that are in the audience and uh, for those of you that think really hard about building out lifestyle apps, I know many folks would love to know sort of key insights on how you may be thinking about monetization, how you may encourage folks, you know, things you may have tried, things you maybe are looking at on how you can re really make money, uh, not only from the Apple App Store but other monetization vectors. Or maybe you want to keep it a secret and not share it with anyone. So. I, I used to actually work at Google and worked on AdSense uh, and a lot on mobile ads. Uh, and as a lifestyle app, I would, unless you really have no other option, not recommend you doing that as your default monetization strategy. Um, I say that not because it's not a viable option, but because I think that's kind of a good last resort. Uh, I, I think what's interesting about mobile is that people are engaging with your app on a pretty regular basis. Uh, and you can do a lot of things with the way that they're engaging with it, not just their eyeballs that are really interesting. So on Foursquare, when we're thinking about what are kind of more native ways of monetizing that attention, that interaction, it's really, hey, what are people using the service for to discover places to go? Uh, what would people, and from an advertising context, potentially want to pay for? Well, it's, hey, if I'm a business and I want to motivate people where to go, like this seems like a perfect kind of matching of uh, intents. Uh, so I think if you can identify places in your experience where there are people using the service to get value, 
And then there is like the flip side of that, which are people who might want to be able to drive more traffic, uh, whether it's to places or books or maybe audio content. Uh, these are all kind of really native ways that that can integrate into your core experience. And I think ideally, whatever you do to monetize your service is actually providing some kind of extra value to users. Like we really want to see people who are merchants or local businesses creating great offers that they can then drive traffic to that are also making the experience more valuable for people. Uh, and I, I think it's hard to say you're doing that when you're kind of putting like, you know, an ad mob display ad at the top of your app. Uh, so if you can find something that feels native and feels valuable for users, I think that's definitely a good kind of avenue to explore. Other thoughts on money? One of my favorite topics. I want money. Um, <laughs> Aside from direct sales, which I think everybody has aspirations to be able to get to and to support, um, I also think that you know, we're sort of at a, at a place in, in the evolution of the mobile economy where uh, a lot of these ads that, that you know, are from networks um, will sort of become much more valuable to publishers. Um, if you follow the progression through the desktop web, um, really distributed ad platforms is what enabled the web to get to the place that it is today. Um, allowing everybody to have a business model, even if you didn't have a million users um, or you know even a hundred thousand CEOs. Um, so I, I would be very closely paying attention to what's going on in the, the ad space and mediation um, and data, particularly. Um, you know, all of those things are probably going to be hashed out in the next year or two here, and and a lot of those things will probably, in in, in sort of our expectation, bring. Um, a lot more dollars into the space, um, both from your brand advertisers as well as, as people doing performance advertising. So whatever is your, your, your various niche and how your audience is being attracted, I think that you'll find ways to, to monetize them um, in the not too distant future. Other thoughts? We actually launched our uh, ad uh, platform this week in ad tech in New York, and our strategy is really based on advertising, but not in that uh, same uh, manner as, as banners. Uh, we have a system that enables uh, businesses, local businesses, global chains across the U.S. to upload their locations. So we have kind of like a locator pin where you can put the information of the business, opening hours, and based on that, we expose the information to drivers, whether at the beginning, at the end. Um, you can search for them, and it creates both uh, brand awareness. You actually see that the businesses are around you, as well as enables uh, them to see how many people are around them, statistically, uh, how many people clicked on the pin, how many people navigated to the store. So the whole issue of, of bringing people to the location is something that we're concentrating as part of the uh, location-based uh, advertisement. And uh, we have self-serve, so anybody can, can actually uh, add his business. We did that in Israel as a pilot in the last year. It worked very well. All the major brands, all the major businesses are actually um, uh, being uh, displayed on the Waze map, and there is a competition, actually, in that the more money you bid, the, the better placement you have. And it creates even kind of niche uh, kind of uh, activities where people, let's say, want to put their uh, location for their wedding. And so you can actually search very much like, let's say, a Facebook event. You can search for that place and navigate to it and, and see the details and, and get there. So uh, we are focusing on that, and we think that there is definitely uh, revenue here. Ryan, any thoughts? Yeah. Um, so we... we uh, we derive a lot of our revenue through direct ad sales. Um, we also have a self-serve platform, and one of the things that we allow um, aspiring authors and publishers to do is uh, advertise in book genres that they're interested in or advertise near works that are similar to theirs. And I guess the one thing I would say is, you know, if you can establish some type of relevance with the experience that people are, are you know, associated with in their apps. So if it's, you know, they're looking at books and similar books, I mean, obviously that will help your monetization if you decide to go the ad route, and it's worked for us. So I have one final question, and then we'll all open it up um, to those of you in the audience. So my question is, are there any best practices you can share in terms of dealing with the duopoly that we talked about, in terms of your relationship with Apple, your relationship with Google, and how you can uh, best get featured in the store, get your app approved, whatever it may be? Uh, many folks out here um, would probably be interested in any thoughts you may have around that. Anyone want to tackle that question? <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> no. 
All right, um, I, I'll take the refusal to answer as tacit no comment. <laughs> Getting the CEO of Apple to recommend is definitely something that's, <laughs> that's a good practice. <laughs> but it's, it's, there, there's no, I, I can't so say So you were very happy for iOS, yeah, we is what we're saying? <laughs> We were very happy at getting recommended. Uh, I mean, uh, I would not not say beyond that, but I think there's no it, it, there's no science here. There's nothing that you can do, kind of like a textbook, uh, and and get to be featured. I think it's in a lot of cases uh, being at the right place at the right time, and uh, I think that uh, overall, from what at least I've seen, they're, they're very open. I mean, they they look at new apps. They are interested in, in, in promoting you. There are teams that are looking for things that are new. And I think that once you have something that has at least something unique or a bit outstanding, I think that it is, a, it is uh, possible to get featured. I guess I would say from a numbers perspective, uh, the, long, the, the more mature you get, the less meaningful. I think the promotions actually wind up being uh, without, I guess, revealing numbers that they might not want us to share. I think uh, we, we usually see the promotion kind of having like, again, like this like temporary boost, uh, and it's great, but it also doesn't last forever. And as a percentage of your traffic, as you get bigger and bigger, it actually becomes less and less meaningful. Um, earlier in the early days, I think the kind of biggest difference between Apple and Google is that Google kind of wants to promote anyone building like any reasonably good Android experience. And that's still the case. Uh, I think having just a well-designed app and making sure Google knows that you have like an app that doesn't look like you just use their native controllers at any styling. Uh, they're pretty happy to showcase that. Uh, Apple, the kind of interesting thing, and you can see this from their commercials, is that they want they, they in general seem to like apps that have a really clear kind of single purpose. Uh, I think it took us probably a year and a half for Apple talking them like on a semi-weekly basis to really understand what Foursquare was because it didn't fit neatly into kind of one single purpose. Uh, so if you're building an app and it has a single purpose, great, make sure they know it. And if it doesn't have one purpose, then make sure they can understand like the primary case. Uh, I think one of our developer partner people there once said to us, like, hey, if we were gonna put you in a commercial, what would that three second like glimpse of your application look like in that commercial? Uh, and you should probably think about that when you're, if you're ever kind of talking with Apple or think about how you wanna position it with them. Yeah. Advice. All right, so we're gonna open it up to um, you folks. If you'll just raise your hand, we have some mic runners on the outside. We're gonna alternate, I believe, in interleaving. So we'll go left side first and then right side. Go ahead right here. So um, have you run into any issues with um, monetization strategies for a desktop web environment kind of feeling like they're pirating or fighting the reasonable monetization strategies for your mobile environment? Um, where the two of them kind of come into conflict with one another and you aren't really, uh, where you can say, well, all the success we're getting in the mobile app is hurting our web monetization or vice versa. Um, so how do you uh, um, make monetization strategies that are platform appropriate in that way uh, coexist well? <laughs> sure. Um, I think it's one of those things that we're, we're still experimenting with. I, I don't know that we're at the point where, um, you know, mobile is hurting our, our web monetization. Our web monetization is still going very well, and, you know, we're monetizing mobile also. Um, mobile is a, a harder channel than monetize just because, I mean, we all know the screen real estate is, real estate is smaller. It's a more engaging experience, and I think people are still trying to figure out, like, the best types of mobile ads to run. Um, you know, again, it, you know, for us, it comes back to relevance. It's if you're going to run a book ad that people are actually interested in seeing, and, and I realize that's a holy grail and it's hard to get to, um, but we found that's the best type of ad that works for us. So we try to keep the ads that we run in mobile um, relevant to the books that people are, are reading, and we find that helps. But we haven't seen a ton of conflict as to, oh, no, all of our users are going mobile, and, and that's hurting us. You know, overall, we find it's you know, really good. It's a new channel for us, and we're driving more people to sign up. Over here. Hi, I'd be interested to know um, about the different types of testing you do on different platforms um, to find out what social features are working well um, in native apps and then on the web and mobile web. Um, and by extension, how you decide which ones to roll out where based on that testing. Well, uh, you can do a lot of testing on Android pretty quick testing and iterating testing on, on, on a native platform. So 
if you guys are looking to find a, a great environment for that, I would recommend Android. Uh, just the, the release cycles um, s dramatically. That's primarily because of the approval process. Correct. You know, so you can re instantly release apps, um, particularly for new user funnels. Um, you know, from the, the onset when we developed social features, we started with our users. We, we brought users in, we surveyed users, and, and got a sense of what, what types of social features that they wanted. Um, you know, I, I think that that's where sort of the locus of your, your social features is gonna, gonna become. You know, you, you're gonna wanna start sort of more from a, a blank drawing, you know, a, a blank board rather than sort of just what social features can I put in, I'll test these and see if they work. Um, what we what we look at is we set a pretty high barrier for social features in general, um, just for the purposes of decluttering the app. You know, if you um, we ended up focusing on on sort of three main features, which is what people are listening to, um, which is sort of more of the broadcasting method. Um, what and then the most important ones are are what people are thumbing up and what people are adding to their favorites because those are the most interesting social actions um, to other people. They also indicate. Um, the highest sort of in our world and level of intent or interest. Um, so we're really looking at those signals to, to share with their friends as well as to understand what people are interested in. Um, you know, as, as far as limiting things, if we're seeing, you know, like under 25% engagement, those things are going to get cut pretty quickly. Um, there's just not enough real estate. And if you want to keep iterating and try new things, you're going to have to cut a lot as you go forward. Other thoughts? I agree about Android. Uh, we test mostly on Android first. It's both faster to develop and faster to deploy. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I also agree. I mean, I, I, I think a lot of people kind of talk about, and it's easy when you look at the documentation on Facebook, it's like, hey, these are the social plugins, at least on web. It's like, hey, just sprinkle these around your site, and magically people will start converting higher, uh, and people will invite their friends to do things that maybe make sense or maybe don't make sense in your platform. Uh, I think the biggest thing that you should start with is in general, like look at how people are primarily using your app. Uh, and I think, yeah, adding the minimal possible changes that fit in with the main flows that people are going through that actually make more sense with friends. Uh, I mean, you can imagine anytime anyone takes an action, you can open like a like request dialogue to like share that with a friend and that would probably really frustrate most of your users. Uh, I think the point earlier today was like, hey, like a lot of apps ask you to invite friends when they're signing up but you've never even used a service, why would you invite them? I think that, that's something that the, the next wave of development is really taken into consideration. Uh, I guess the only other thing I would say there is, you know, it makes sense to spend the time where people are spending the time in your app. I think it's really easy to be aspirational about how you want people to use your product. Like, yeah, as an example with Foursquare, like I wish that everyone wrote tips about awesome things to do at restaurants. Uh, it turns out that like, you know, on a given day, about 10% of our active users write a tip versus checking in, which is a much more common action. Uh, we could spend as much time on tips and sharing there, but honestly, like, you know, we'd have to have literally an order of magnitude bigger impact there to increase our sharing compared to checking in. So kind of being self-aware about where people are using the different functionality in your app and instead of just kind of aspirational about how you wish they used it, uh, it's it sounds obvious, but it's kind of hard to do. Um, okay. Question here? Yeah. So can you give us an example of a great failure you had and what came out of it? Sorry, say that the again? Example of a great failure you had and uh, what came out of it. Yeah, one of my questions I had prepared was if you could take a time machine, sort of get in the time machine and go back to where you were first developing your product, uh, you know, what one thing would you have not done? Um, I can, in so I think our first great failure was implementing Open Graph and Hoping it solved everything. That's not what I expected to hear. <laughs> <laughs> that is not what I. But please continue. So, so <laughs> this is the, the the reality of all of these situations is that there's no panacea for growth. There's no like you can't just implement social and then expect Facebook to be responsible for your growth. You you know once we realized you know a couple of weeks into it that this is really an evolving platform and we started dedicating engineers and product people to the processes that we were doing with integrating with, with Facebook, then we started to see the graph go in the direction that we wanted to go in that way. So, you know, uh, it's a it's a, a very pretty shiny sort of goal to get to, which is the sort of growth that, that comes uh, automatically, but but really that is about focusing on, on actually tailoring your experience. Um, and I go back to the thing that we learned really quickly, which was social, 
needs more for our existing users than it does for our for our new users. And like a bonfire, like the more that they're using social, the more they're spreading your your word around to everybody. And and so we sort of stopped as soon as we made sure that the that the inbound flows were really clean. We just spent all the time getting people on to Facebook, connected to Facebook, and using the social features. And the way we're doing that was not just you know, saying, all right, we publish actions. Like, what do you do with actions? How are actions meaningful to users? Um, and, and really sort of filtering that set down to you know, what, what people really care about. Other thoughts, failure, things you wish you hadn't have done? I, I think two, I have two let's say, examples I can think of. One was in the early days of the Android. Uh, we came up with our first Android version after a fairly successful iOS one, and it was too early. We didn't, uh, I think, comprehend what is known today, the amount of different devices and operating system variations that, that existed and things that worked uh, in our development environment and even testing environment simply didn't <laughs> work in the field and we had a lot of crashes and, and problems. Um, and another thing is just like a small feature, we had an abuse, kind of like report abuser. So people that you know wrote things or misbehaved, et cetera, we had kind of like an automated system which took the input and then just banned some users from the system. That didn't work quite as well. Part of it was the, the way that people just, just accidentally pressed buttons and didn't understand it. Part of it was that as part of the gaming, gamification of, of ways some people just decided, okay, let's throw this person out and kind of like uh, block him. And that was, I think, at least from our point of view, a bit of a mistake. Other thoughts? I guess I would say our biggest mistake, which was also in some way turned out to be a little bit of a success story, was in January we kind of had all these different kind of features in flight, and we decided, hey, you know what? This sounds like a totally new version of Foursquare, uh, which combined, I guess it kind of was, but the problem was that we also kind of fooled ourselves into thinking all these features had to be kind of coupled together as we were building them. Uh, and we decided, hey, we're actually, yeah, we're doing a whole new release uh, not to knock Microsoft, but it was a very like Microsoft, like, hey, this is like Windows 8, and before we had Windows 7. Uh, but the difference is we're not releasing desktop software that you have to print on a DVD. We're releasing mobile software, which you push every two weeks. Uh, so we basically stopped shipping uh, for about four or five months, which seems like an eternity internally. Yep. Uh, it caused a ton of internal frustration. Uh, we collected no data, no incremental data from user better functionality, and we launched this whole new app. And like the good story was, like, hey, like actually the, the metrics were generally uh, better and they moved in the direction we wanted to move and we were happy with the product. Uh, but then we spent the next three months actually basically like turning off half the features to figure out which ones actually moved the needle. Uh, and it was like playing forensics, basically. We were like trying to detect like, oh yeah, like we changed the compose screen in these seven different ways. Like if we turn off each of them one at a time, which actually had the biggest contribution? Uh, so I guess my advice from that would be very rarely do you actually need a couple kind of major features together. And as much as you think you might, like think about the downsides of that. Uh, if anything, just like the internal morass that starts when you're not shipping, like the joy of building something new is getting into the hands of users. And the longer you kind of like defer that, the longer that code kind of sits on the shelf, uh, I think the more frustrated people get. Uh, and especially in this day and age, like four or five months does really seem like a long time. Uh, so I would, Strongly recommend not doing that if you can avoid it. So yeah, that, that's that's a great one. I think um, I'm sure we've all experienced that. Like I've got the perfect idea and you launch it and you're like, oh well, I should have been shipping all along. I think you said something else too, which I think we've definitely learned at Goodreads is you know earlier I mentioned something about really making sure you listen to your users and collecting their feedback and, and continuing to deliver things that really meets their needs and delights. Um, the one thing to be careful about with that is. Um, you have to make sure that they meet the needs of a core group of your users or a significant number um, because you can fall into a trap of building lots of features for lots of different separate users and that, that only exacerbates itself once you become much bigger. Um, and then it, it's a lot easier to give a feature than it is to take away and when you really try to streamline, like you can have a, a ton of features. And um, so that's the one thing I'd keep in mind is um, try to focus your applications, figure out what it is that your users really love and double down on those, but don't get in the trap of just building lots of little things for them. Okay, last question in the back. Uh, or, yeah, there you go. So deploying on web and mobile is pretty different. Um, what we've noticed is that on web we can iterate faster and deploy faster. 
but on mobile it's a little slower. Um, have you guys found any anything internally that has has helped with deploying faster on mobile? No, in the cases where performance is not important. Um, Open graph helps. No, I'm just kidding. No, <laughs> of course it helps. Um, so sign up pages, for example, is a great place for deploying um, web inside mobile apps. Invite flows, um, connection to Facebook flows. Um, you know, we've noticed, you know, obviously that the more you tell a user about why you're using their Facebook data, the more likely they are to give you more data for you to make better experiences with. And so understanding how that works and, and sort of whether, you know, four steps is better than three steps because the fourth step is an information step. Um, all of those things require iteration, A-B testing, and, and really where we've gotten really fast with that is in our, in our invite, in our, in our registration screens. Uh, a lot of those are, are web-based um, where we can. Um, now that, that takes a little bit of work to instrument sort of the, 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 the web and native bridge. Um, but once you sort of, if you think about that from an abstract perspective for a week, you can build into your native app almost everything that you need from a, from a call perspective that you can call it from a web view, essentially, you know, uh, whether it's iOS or Android. And so, you know, we did that and, and we've been able to, you know, sort of push changes on, you know, every two or three days to our, our Facebook flows and every single one you sort of, as long as you have enough users going through the flow, you're getting, you're making positive gains and, you know, you'll find really interesting things like, you know, two sentences are better than, than one sentence or, you know, people like this color button rather than another button and it's meaningful. So, you know, I think being, you know, being tactical about where you're implementing the web can really help. Right. Thank you, panelists. Enjoyed it.